Roger Cohen, how are you feeling, sir? Good. How are you doing, my man? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. We just talking about a bunch of crazy stuff, and now we're gonna go to the more sensible part of my broadcast. And but first of all, I want you to introduce yourself and tell everybody what you what you do and what what you what you're doing that is that that is making news right now. Sure. Uh, my name is Bradford Cohen. I am an attorney in Fort Lauderdale, and uh, we put in for commutations on uh, on Kodak Black and uh, Lil Wayne. Yeah, commutations are pardons. One's a pardon, one's a commutation. Okay, please explain the difference. Sure. On Kodak, uh, we didn't put in for a full pardon. A commutation is usually a little bit of a lighter lift. Right. And in, regard in regards to Kodak, it would it would shorten his term. That's essentially what we're saying in Kodak's case, is that he got an excessive amount of time. So because he got an excessive amount of time, we're just seeking a commutation to lower the time that he got to essentially a time served. He's been in for about 21 months in a mm -hmm. maximum security prison. In Wayne's case, we're asking for a pardon because the case is really, you know, I'm a big Second Amendment guy. And in Wayne's case, I'm a big believer in if you are a prior nonviolent felon, you should be able to possess a firearm. And it's just me who, who believes in that. You know, there's a couple actually Supreme Court justices that believe the same thing that I do, uh, that felons should be able to restore their rights. But in Wayne's case, it was a firearm that was essentially never fired, that was found in a plane, and um, that's what they were charging him with. So we're asking for a pardon for Wayne. Okay, so so I'm a 2A guy, so I'm a Second Amendment guy as well. I believe people acting stupid is knowing everybody got it. So that's, that's where I'm at. I'm fine with that. Like, I'm, uh, we're good. Um, the commutation, I understand the commutation. You pretty much end the sentence. Does that still, what does that do for Kodak Black? Does that make him where he's still a felon? It's on his record. He can't get the gun. He can't do anything. They just they just bring the sentence to an end. Correct. That's what it's going to do. Um, and the only reason he's a convicted felon is because of this federal case. Actually, before the federal case, he was not a convicted felon. That's kind of a, a misnomer in his case. A lot of people thought it was a firearm case, and it's not a firearm case. It was that he lied on a form in order to obtain a firearm. He didn't lie about a, being a felon. He lied, allegedly, about that he had a that it knowingly lied about that he had a case that was pending in another jurisdiction that would affect the interstate commerce clause, the Hobbs Act. 99% mm -hmm. uh, of America doesn't even know what the Hobbs Act is. What is but, it? So essentially, it, the interstate commerce clause is if you commit a crime and it affects other states, you can be charged federally. Now, that it's so broad that like if you robbed uh, a 7-Eleven and the gun you're using was made in Virginia and you're robbing a 7-Eleven in New York, you get charged. Fe you can get charged federally with that because mm -hmm. the gun was made. It affects interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. So there's so many crimes that they could charge that affect interstate commerce. They generally don't. But when it comes to high profile people, I always say the higher the profile you are, the higher the profile you are on the list for feds. You know, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't benefit you being high profile and, and and especially with the pets now at the same time and this is you know when i was asked to do the interview these were some of the things that were, that, that were going through my mind it also has to do with the fact that you're acting like a damn fool because if you didn't act like a damn fool you wouldn't be on the on the on the radar of the feds there's got to be a little bit of that so as you're trying to commute this man's case and pardon this man are you having conversations with these people like listen you're doing too much so i always have conversations with all my clients right the 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 relationship i have with like kodak is a little bit different than the relationship I have with just my everyday clients. I've known the kid since he's 17. He just turned 22. He, he's a babe. He's a kid, right? So, like, you've grown up in the industry. You know what it's like. And, and you know, to give a 17 or 18-year-old uh, a lot of things when you're 17 or 18, you're not – and I'm a big believer in – most kids' brains don't fully develop until they're like 22, 23. They don't understand everything. Now, I'm not making excuses. You know, kids do stupid stuff because sometimes they're just stupid. Mm -hmm. That being said, I don't think decision-making is, is that high on the priority list when you're 15 to 24. I think it's a very dangerous time coupled with money, coupled with fame. It's a tough road, right? Now, I, again, I'm not saying that to feel bad for famous people. 
I'm saying that as a fact. So I have conversation with Kodak in terms of what are we doing to move forward? I'm a forward thinking guy. We yeah. have what we have now, but let's think what we're doing to move forward. He's in a, a headspace that he understands. Yeah, he's screwed up. He's done some things in his past that he's screwed up with. But I know that he is ready to, to really take on the role that he has become during this whole time period of giving back to his community. He, he pays for, for kids to go to college. He pays for turkey drives. I mean, this kid is like out there. And before he was arrested, he was doing this. But he knows now that he really has a role in that community, especially in South, uh, South Florida, that he wants to adopt into his life and take it a step further. You know, we talk about religion. We talk about books. It was I don't want to say this was good for him because I don't think prison is good for anybody. It's a bad place. Nobody wants I wouldn't work. I wouldn't work. I wouldn't beg for that to be put on my worst enemy. That's how bad prison system is in America. But that being said. I think it gave him time to focus, to understand where he made mistakes. He's gone on Twitter, and he, he'll call in and say, like, hey, I want to apologize to T.I. I want to apologize to, uh, to, you know, anybody that I offended in the past. I want to apologize to this person. And that's he's not just apologizing just for the sake of apology. You don't know Kodak. Like, he really, when he does things like that, he's a, it's a genuine apology. So he is in a, a headspace, I think, right now that he understands what he needs to do to move forward. And I just think there's going to be great things for him. I'm hoping this comes through. I'm not putting all my chips on the table. I'm not putting all my eggs in a basket and say, oh, yeah, this is definitely going to happen. If it comes true, I think he's ready to take on the role that I think he always should take on. And that is of uh, the community leader that he is. And I, I know some people are like, ha, 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 you know, Kodak's not a community leader. He is. He is a community leader. In his area, he, he helps so many people that sometimes he does it anonymously. And it's not even in just his area. Like, he's done it, you know, it, I'll be talking to him about something, and he'll donate money to uh, somebody in Texas because I saw something in a newspaper. Some kid needs a wheelchair. He buys the kid a wheelchair. But he does it anonymously. He doesn't tell anybody about that stuff. And that's the thing that a lot of people don't hear about. All right, I'm going to tell you something. From a man who has had many individuals in my life that is going to jail, someone next to him that's going to babysit him for the first year that he's out. Because here's the I agree. Thing. When you go to jail, you say to your, girl, to your girlfriend, to your family, I'm gonna come out. I'm gonna do my thing. I'm gonna be. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna cheat on you. You're not gonna catch me with that woman. I'm gonna go to work. I'm gonna do this. When you come out, you do that shit for like a month, and then you get back to the same habits. So you're definitely gonna need someone to be there with him to right the ship. We're gonna get into that shortly because I want to talk about that later in the interview. But I want to start here. How, have you gone for presidential pardons and commutations before? Have I? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Have, have I you done? Gone, have you gone for presidential pardons and sure. commutations before? Sure. Other, yes, I have. Okay. How, what is the process? Um, so there's a there's a essentially a pardon or a commutation packet. Each one is different. Uh, you fill them out uh, with with pertinent information, and then I also do. I'm I'm very passionate guy about what I do, so I do a full memo on the individual. Like I I, I want to personalize everybody, so I want to talk about the type of good work that they've done in the past, the cases that they have, what the explanation is for the cases, their family life, where they grew up, how they grew up, and I'm a big proponent of you know w when it comes to these type of things. And I'm I'm everybody knows I love prison reform, I love justice reform. I, I'm like on board a thousand percent. I think that before you get to prison reform, before you get to justice reform, you should look at these neighborhoods that these kids are growing up in. We need to do something to stop the systemic actions of these kids, that it's a circle and a circle and a circle. And they see the kids doing the wrong thing, getting hot cars, getting hot girls, getting hot money, you know, all those things that they see growing up and then coupled with the violence that they see, it is breeding grounds to then you then you've got to ask for justice reform. But maybe if we stop it at that level, we don't have to ask for 
for to go 3,000% on justice reform because we're stopping it and we're giving those kids a way out besides football and rap and mm -hmm. basketball. And, all and, the, all and the, all one to a thousand. Right. All the traditional channels of getting out of the ghetto. Um, how were you able to reach Donald Trump and his team to do this? So just the regular channels that you, you know, you could have, um, whenever there's, whenever there is a, uh, a, a pardon or, or a commutation that's pending, um, there's the pardon office, there's individuals that work for the pardon office and you advocate on your, on your individual's behalf. And in addition to advocating on, on those people's behalf, you also bring attention to them, bring attention to their cause, bring attention to their commutation or their pardon. In this case, you know, we had a lot of support. Uh, from Lil Yachty and Lil Pump and 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 uh, uh, Gucci Mane and Jake Paul, like all these guys that really uh, Dave Portnoy, who's fantastic. He's got a great thing going right now, which is the Barstool Fund. I think the guy is is spectacular. Um, things like that that draw attention uh, to to your plight, to what what's going on, to why uh, they're deserving, and then you know you try to recruit as many advocates as you can for the cause. So mm -hmm. like as many people that you know that would be respected by the White House or be respected by the public mm -hmm. to also chime in and give, um, you know, give their uh, opinion on whether or not they feel that either A, the sentence was too long or B, that this individual should be pardoned because it's a wrongful conviction or it's a wrongful charge or it just shouldn't be charged in the first place. Okay, so now... <clears throat> Do you, in this process, do you actually talk to Donald Trump or this is all people from, a, from like, people on the outside, ancillary people? Or do you so talk it's, to the record? It, it's ancillary. So, it's, you know, you're not, you're not calling the president himself and saying, like, hey, I need this done. Like, you know, you don't do that. Uh, but you're talking to a lot of people uh, that, that probably could uh, discuss it with the president, could, could get move this further. And like I said, everything you're doing is just advocacy for your client. And like, when it comes to advocacy for your client, there's nobody that, that does it better than me. Like I, I go the, you know, as far as I can in terms of recruiting as many people, getting calling out to as many people, discussing it with, discussing his case with individuals that I know that are my other clients that from on the internet, you know, Trayvon Mullins or, or Lamar Jackson or anybody else that I could possibly get uh, mm. to discuss the case. Okay, so now, my second question is this. We see Little Wayne go to the White House and take a picture, or wh wherever he was, the White House, wherever he was, he took a picture, he basically put his arm around Trump. That photo op went viral, right? So that, right. that, that, went, that went absolutely viral. Sure. Um, we now know why he did that. We know why he did that. Was that something that you urged him to do, or is that something he did on his own? So anything that I discuss with my clients, obviously, is attorney-client privilege. But I know that Wayne was very concerned about the, the platinum plan, like, honestly, is concerned about the platinum plan, honestly concerned about judicial reform and prison reform. And that was the that was the whole impetus of that meeting was that he really wanted to discuss and he did discuss prison reform, justice reform, what the platinum plan would mean to certain communities, how that money would be divvied out. I mean, it was a pretty detailed little discussion that he had with the president and, it, you know, multiple people were in the room and they were discussing, you know, how they were going to roll out the platinum plan and also what they had in store for justice reform and prison reform, which I thought when I when I heard about it, I thought it was going to be, you know, it looked like it was a great plan and it looked like the justice reform and prison reform that they had in mind was going to be was going to be pretty, uh, pretty large. OK, so so without breaking uh attorney-client privilege, did you say to him at any time, this is what the optics are going to look like? It's going to um, look like, it's gonna yeah, look like you did really... this for this, and because of that, people are not going to trust it or respect it. I, I, never, I never discuss optics. If, if one of my clients says, I want to meet with you know, Bill Gates uh, to talk about you know, uh, what the next step of Microsoft is, that's up to them to meet with Bill Gates to discuss what the next step of Microsoft is. So I, I don't, you know, I know there's people out there that look at certain moves and certain things and say like, oh, this is why this was done or this is why this was done. I mean, it, it, they don't know 
what the real intent was behind it. And I do know what the intent was. And that was to discuss prison and justice reform. And like I said, I don't school my clients on this is what the optics are going to look like or anything like that. My clients want to do something as long as it's not going to hurt like their case. Like if a client says, hey, I want to go out in public and I want to talk about my case that just happened and I want to say this or that, I always you know, give the advice, hey, that's not a smart idea. But at the end of the day, I'm not the captain of the ship. You know, they're the captain of the ship. All I can do, I'm the rudder, right? Yeah, I'll see you one way or the other, but you're, right. you're going to do – and, and I, I love Wayne. I, I think Wayne is an intelligent guy, a smart guy. He, when I speak to him about justice – and I spoke to him many times about justice reform and, and, and prison reform, and, and he gets it. I, I just think he's a, a very, very – a big-hearted guy and a warm guy. I, I love Wayne. I love Wayne. And I love Kodak, too. Listen – I, I try to treat all my clients like I would want my family member to be treated. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it, it is, it's always a, a hard road when people are charged with a crime and you're, the, you're basically their, their rock, right? You're basically their shoulder. So I try to take all that stress, all that pressure off of them and put it on myself and try to do a good job for everybody. And I try to give the best that, uh, advice that I can. And I think right. both of these guys have listened. And that, that's a tough thing. I mean, I'll just tell you, because right when we were talking about doing the interview, I said that I, I was definitely going to be real and, and transparent. I looked at it as extremely, I looked at Wayne going to the White House as extremely self-serving, having an agenda, and what all I hope, all I hope is this, that if he does pardon them, you don't turn around and do something ridiculous later. Kodak Black, if he does commute your sentence, don't turn around and do something ridiculous later because you have now you have now used that pardon when somebody else could have taken that pardon and I somebody really needed it. So so for me, for me, I understand that you deal with high net worth individuals, very powerful individuals. Do you do not this always. People, by the way, not always. Who, 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 all right, that's what I was about to ask. Do you do this for the average man? And how can the average man get in a position where he could look at a president, he or she could look at a presidential party? So the, the exact same way. I, I don't, I, first of all, I want to be very specific. Yeah, I have clients with high net worth. I have clients with a lot of fame. But that's not like, that's not the bulk of my of my practice. The bulk of my practice is is, is you know, Joe Blow from the street. Like, that's the bulk of my practice. And not only is that the bulk of my practice, but people that know me know me that, that I do tons of pro bono work. Like, it, when, I, when I represent individuals that, you know, that pay me a certain amount of money, it frees my time up so that I can represent individuals for nothing. So, like, it averages out for me. So, like, I'm not, you know, I drive a, a pickup truck. Like, I'm not spending money on, on dumb shit. I, I, I truly believe in the justice system, I want everybody to have justice. Does that mean I'm going to take a murder case that's going to take my whole entire year for free? Mm -hmm. Probably not. But right. am I? number one is I've assisted in cases where they want me to take a second look or something like that, where it's a huge case. And I've assisted in those cases. But I've also taken like third and second degree felonies where the guy says to me, hey, listen, you know, I don't have any money, but I'm getting railroaded. And if I look at the case and I agree that he's getting railroaded, you I take it. Oh, not, not even not even thinking about it. You know, people send me, sometimes they'll send me today on Instagram. Someone sent me a, a tape of a guy getting a shit beat out of him and charged with something. I told him, give me a call. I'll handle it for free. I, and I don't even care. You, you take the civil case and give it to somebody else. Set, call Ben Crump. Call anybody else. And Ben Crump, to me, is phenomenal. And there's a lot of guys that do that type of work that are phenomenal. But you, you got a criminal case and, and you got the shit beat out of you or something else happened. I, I, call me up. Like, I, I, I will help that out. And I always do. So no, no, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm a passionate guy about my clients. I'm a passionate guy about the justice system. And I think that truly lawyers sometimes get a bad rap because, because you see the, the dickhead lawyers, right? The lawyers that take money, they don't do anything for it. They sit back, they're driving around in a Porsche or they're doing something stupid. And, and everyone's like, ah, oh, this guy's in it for this or this guy's in it for that. I truly believe that each lawyer, if they take on their own responsibility for their clients and their caseload and really, really look at their cases and, and work their cases 
you can make a difference. Like I had a kid, uh, just to divert for a second. I had a kid, his name was Pierre Chevlon, right? I remember the kid's name. It was, it was literally 21 years ago that I had this kid. He had 24 grand theft autos. What happened back in the day, he, he was a kid. He got caught with like one or two stolen cars. And then they, they blamed him for like 23 of them. Mm -hmm. He got charged as an adult. It, the only thing they had to link him to all these cars was his statement. Well, I filed a motion to suppress that statement to get it mm -hmm. thrown out. And before it was even heard, the state attorney came to me and said, hey, listen, if, if we agree to only charge him with one grand theft and give him juvenile sanctions and agree to seal it afterwards, would you do the deal? This right. kid's like, I'll take the deal in a second. The kid's 15 years old, and he's looking right. at, like, going to jail. Mm -hmm. So he takes the deal. Literally, maybe 10 years later, so he's 15, about, about 11 years later, I get a letter in the mail that says, I don't think you remember me, but my name's Keir Chevlon. When I read it, I remembered him in a second right way. I knew right away. He goes, I just want to thank you. I joined the military when I turned 18. I'm married. I have three kids. I'm a successful guy in the military. I'm going to open my own business. And it's all thanks to what you did. Because if I got stuck with 23 felonies, I would have never been able to do that. Bro, no. like, shit like that. And I don't know how it affects normal. Like, I don't know if, if regular lawyers don't. It doesn't affect. It affects me very personally that I had a hand in 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 making that kid take a right instead of a left. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, definitely. Like, take I'm my sure job. Doesn't, I'm sure he doesn't need the fucking. I'm sure he rides a bike back. He probably doesn't even drive a car, man. He probably doesn't even drive a car. So listen, if anybody is out here and they need help with anything legal and more importantly, possibly getting a commutation for one of their friends or family or a party, how can they do it? And number two is parties, do they happen every year or do they usually happen at the end of a pres presence? So they can happen every year. Generally, they don't. Generally, they happen at the end of a presidency. Um, so so that's the issue. So that, that's part one. Part two, how do you do it? You go on the DOJ website. There is an application. You download the application. You fill, fill out the application. Now, if there's anybody that's doing it on their own, and they need assistance and they want some advice on how to like, Hey, you know, how do we do, do we do a memo? What, do, what should we include? They should email me. I'll, I'll be happy. I, listen, I'm more than happy to tell people this is what you need. Listen, I'll, I'll stop. No, let me stop you. Sometimes you have to pay to get it done the right way. That's all I have to say. Sure. Where can they find you? Uh, I'm in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, uh, you know, I'm on, you can Google me. I'm on Instagram, but, uh, it's Bradford Cohen and, uh, I'm in Fort Lauderdale, Florida down, uh, by the courthouse. I'm right outside the Fort Lauderdale courthouse. Uh, and my phone number is 954-523-7774. The best way to reach me is by email or on Instagram because I will give me Instagram real quick. Yeah, because it's, it's hard when I get a ton of messages at the office to return everybody. But if you explain to me what you, you know, what pardon you're putting in for, what commutation you're putting in, I'll be more than happy to walk somebody through that process. All right. Give them your Instagram real quick before we get out of here. My Instagram is at Law Ronin, L-A-W-R-O-N like in Nancy, I-N like in Nancy. Got you. Law Ronin. I will, I will reach when I touch down in, in, in uh, FLL. I'll definitely come my back. Man, it, would be, it would be my pleasure to take you out anytime. Big fan. I've always been a big fan. I think you're, and I love, I love your Instagram. I love, I love what you're doing. You're always speaking the truth and you're always like, you're, you're straight up with everybody. And I appreciate that. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Like I said, I'll be down in FLL probably in the middle of February. I'll come check you. You let me know. Thanks, man. All right. God bless. God bless. God bless. That's Lord Ronan right there. Batman Scoop. Visit BatmanScoop.com to buy merch.